Hello, today is Thursday, July 23rd, 2020. This is the week and charts. Obviously, I want to thank all you guys and girls for attending today. It looks like more and more people are finding the show, so that's exciting. So what are we going to talk about? Well, obviously, current market conditions. I'm going to have a lot to say about that. Mostly, in fact, this week, we'll just talk about it when we get to the live charts. Your questions on trading. Speaking of live charts, if they're not related to what's on the slides, if you don't mind, wait until we get to the live charts, just so I don't go off on a rant or my ADD doesn't kick in. And then once we do get to the live charts, your favorite stock picks, please just ask about one at a time. That's for your benefit. So what are we talk about? Well, today I kind of set out to talk a lot about the wisdom of Darvis. And this all comes, as we talked about last week, from How I Made $2 Million and the Stock Market by Nicholas Darvis. And I was going to talk a lot about his wisdom. And like I said last week, I'm working on a piece which has a lot of his wisdom about trading psychology, money management, technical analysis. Although he did use some fundamentals at first, failed miserably, and then he incorporated them later, which I have a bit of a problem with. But we'll get into that next week. And I'm still working on this piece, which just keeps growing and growing and growing. So a lot of a lot of good stuff in the book. And if you go to DaveLander.com slash books dash two dash read, you can get it there. It's five bucks. I'll probably make 10 cents if you buy it from me or from my link. But it's better than the Pocono, and I'll put that back into the website. But anyway, there's a plethora of knowledge in there. It's certainly worth five bucks. Now, you could pick apart a few things, and I will sort of show you some of those things in today's presentation. But it can work in certain times and in certain markets. And I'll explain that in just one second. Before we do all that, as explain the screen, as you know, you can lose money trading, or as often sum it up, all predictions are about the future, and a lot of stuff can happen between now and then on my website i have these bear market updates i'm going to have to change that bear to bull on my newsletter i changed bear to bull and the market kind of tanked for a little while <laughs> so i'm kind of afraid to change it but that'll give you the latest columns that i've been referencing as of late and i'll probably take that link off the website soon all right Let's talk about Darvis vis-a-vis -vis trading breakout. So I want to focus more on his methodology this week and talk a little bit about breakouts and the good, the bad, and the ugly with breakouts. And here's the deal. You can take any methodology and boil it down to trend following, breakout trading, or reversion to the mean or some combination thereof. So I guess I'm using trend trading with reversion to the mean. And each one will have its own nuances. Now my money management, I think, makes my way of doing things superior, at least so far, I believe that. And I've had very intelligent people look at it and I thought everybody knew this and they actually agree with me and that made me feel really good. And that's a story for another day. Now, before we get into talking about breakouts in the Darvis methodology, one of the criticisms I saw on the internet was that Darvis was in the right place at the right time. Well, most of his money was made in the late 50s. And I went in this morning and plotted a weekly S&P 500. And you could see that there was a pretty decent uptrend in 57, and then there was a downtrend in late 57 or later in 57, and then from 58 through 59, there was this massive, massive uptrend. Now, I'm guessing most of his money was made between 58 and 59. And I'm doing a lot of research here, so I'll know more and more as time goes on as far as when he made it and how he made it, or at least as much as I could find about Nicholas Darvis. So, yeah, he was in the right place at the right time. But if you're in the right place at the right time, you also have to have the ability to recognize that you're in the right place at the right time. I crossed paths with someone and 
in this business, if you stay around, stick around long enough, you'll eventually meet everyone. And, and I have chose not to meet a lot of people who I don't think, or how do I say without getting in trouble? <laughs> There's a lot of scumbags that I have the opportunity to meet that I just don't want to meet. But this one gentleman made $80 million and I was dying to meet him. And there was a brief business thing where I, I just met him for a day. And we were on the same sort of team on something. And that's another story in and of itself. It, it failed miserably. <laughs> but anyway, I asked him flat out. I said, hey, um, did you really make $80 million? He said, yeah, but Dave, I couldn't do that in today's market. He said, and this is something I was thinking. And he said it. He said it was like being in the land of the blind and having one eye. So he was in the right place at the right time, and he admits it. But if you think about it, especially since the way he made his money was a zero-sum game type of derivative, that money had to come from somewhere else. So a lot of other people were at the, in the right place at the right time and didn't make any money. There was a techno-fundamental system that the fundamentals didn't fit the system back in 1999 because the market was going straight up. So they had to scramble to change their system. Value players in 1999 got crushed because the market went straight up. And you just have to recognize if you're in the right place at the right time. And right now, and I'm really working hard to wrap my head around it, but I think we could be in one of those right places once again. You just can't confuse the issue with facts, blood in the street and coronavirus and protests and all this other stuff going on. But the market's going up. And more specifically, these super duper speculative issues are just blasting higher. So I think we have an unbelievable, amazing golden opportunity right now. I just got to wrap my head on around how we're going to capitalize on it. And so far, one way I've capitalized on it very nicely is just through the core methodology, playing the pullbacks along the way. Now, before I digress too far, let me just add one little thing to that. I went back in and looked at my Landry list over the past couple of months, and that's the list that I publish every day. That's my watch list that I publish as part of my tra trading service, in addition to official recommendations which come from that, which come from that. And some of the stocks I passed on for various reasons, mostly because of the volatility and they weren't just absolutely perfect setups in some cases. But the ones, some of the ones that I passed on had amazing runs. Now we did catch a few of them, which thank God, knock on wood, to make it all worthwhile. But some of them had some of them had unbelievable, amazing runs. And so that's part of the adjusting to the conditions. I'm kind of wrapping my head around more volatile stocks. Now, I've got a few people who have just come into the trading services, a couple of people this morning, probably just going to start today. And they're going to think, oh, my God, this guy just trades these wild and crazy stocks. Well, that's the hand that's being dealt. You have to be really careful now not to chase your own tail and not to chase the church of what's happening now. But I think, again, there's a golden opportunity. and And just getting back to playing the hand that's dealt, we're looking at these crazy volatile stocks. And I'm personally actually looking at some that's even a little bit more crazier than what I'm showing you. I'm looking at the ones I'm showing you, but I'm also looking at some that are even crazier. And that's just what's happening now. And it could be, again, a golden opportunity, not to beat the dead horse on that. But the thing with the service is, if you are new to the service and you're like, this guy trades a bunch of crazy stocks, if you were in the service back in late February, early March, you were thinking that this guy just shorts a bunch of big cap stocks because that's what the market was providing. So it all depends on what the market's providing as to what we're trading. Somebody once joked years and years ago, as I said a thousand times, if they found out that intravenous drug use was on the, on the rise, he would be buying needle companies. Like, well, it's not exactly true, but if the needle companies were going higher, I would certainly be buying them. And drug use isn't on the rise, is it? Anyway, 
the sun doesn't shine on the same dog's ass every day is a saying in the South, meaning that different methodologies can work really, really well at different times. Now, this is not to say rush out and try to trade methodologies. As I said a thousand times, when I first met a certain trader many, many, many years ago, he was trading reversals. And so the market broke out and kept on breaking out. And I said, hey, did you get creamed in that reversal? It's like, no, I, I got that reversal. It's like, well, shit, I got creamed in it. You know, what's wrong with me? And then the market broke out and came right back in. I'm like, well, did you get creamed playing that breakout? No, 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 I'm playing reversals now. And so I doubt very seriously that he was able to shift gears that quickly and no one can. And I think you end up chasing your own tail. But there are times where breakouts work really well, and I'm sure back in the late 50s, especially with the bar going straight up, that breakouts worked amazingly well. Well, as I preach, everything works better with trends. So insert your favorite trend following methodology into 1999, and guess what? It would have printed money. A lot of people were blown away with some of the things I did in 99. Well, I was just being a trend following moron, as somebody pointed out. There's nothing magical about that. So everything can be boiled down to pretty much essentially three methodologies, trend following, breakout trading, and reversion to the mean. Now, breakouts work when markets are breaking out and following through. Now, before we get into some of these situations, keep in mind, especially in this day and age where everybody has a computer on their desk, and I have one, two, three computers, you know, so everybody has a computer in a desk, so everybody's going to see the breakout. They no longer work as well as they used to. The turtles, another group of people in the right place at the right time. But if you look at the turtles, there's a few of them that did exceptionally well and then later fell, mi failed miserably, but that's another story. But during the period of the turtles, when they were they, their claim to fame, their glory period, there were some that just couldn't make money. And they all had the same information, the same system. and I'd recommend you read The Way of the Turtle by Curtis Faith. Curtis Faith is quite a character. I probably should stop quoting him, but he's got a lot of good things to say about the market. You do a quick Google on him and you can find out some very interesting things. But I like his attitude towards the market and I like his flippant attitude towards the market. I like The the Way of the Turtle was a good book. And then also Trading from the Gut was even better. Anyway, breakouts work when breakouts are working, okay? In other words, breakouts work when the market is following through. Now, I'm not a breakout player, but I will play breakouts, so to speak, in IPOs, okay? And the reason I'll do that is because IPOs tend to have a breakout characteristic. When an IPO makes a new high, everybody and their brother is happy. Also, it's very hard if not impossible to short an IPO. Maybe market makers can short some to get some supply, but for the most part, nearly impossible for the layman, at least initially, to short an IPO. So that's one of the good things about them. Now, if you take a look at FVAC, one of those stupid acquisition companies, <laughs> years ago, I completely ignored these things because they were just stupid, right? But today's day and age, there's this huge excitement over these Acquisition companies are so-called SPACs, S-P-A-C-S, Special Purpose Acquisition Company, I guess the or S for companies. Anyway, so we take a look at this IPO here, and it had virtually no volume. Some of these days were like 400 shares, if that much. So there was certainly nothing to see here, nothing to do. And then all of a sudden it has a 7 million share day. So apparently somebody woke up and said, hey, that's one of those spocks, one of those stupid spocks. <laughs> and again, church of what's happening now, okay? I, I never dreamed I'd trade one of these spock stocks. I was editing some of the stock selection course that I did a few years back and getting the videos into the new format and to the new system. And in that, I said, hey, you know, you have to trade where the HV is. And right now, the HV is around 40. And I'm finding most of my opportunities around HV 40 to 60 or so. And 60 is high. That's crazy high, right? 
and usually I don't go over 100, but nowadays it's like HVs are 150 or so in stocks that are set up. And I think we just have to play that hand that's dealt and keep playing it until it no longer works. And then we'll just have to see what's working at that point in time and be willing to adjust. Work hard to recognize that you're in the right place at the right time. So the stock finally begins to wake up. Now we're not using volume, although Darvis did look at volume and maybe volume did work better back then, but I'm not a big fan of volume as I've said a thousand times. I don't actually use volume for any predictive capabilities in my trading. Hang on one second, I gotta put an order in. The only reason I use volume or, or the only thing I use volume for is to make sure the stock is liquid enough to trade. Well, 7 million shares is plenty enough shares to trade. So we have this big day where all of a sudden there's volume moving into the stock. So that's the high so far, but we don't know if that's going to continue to be the high or what. Now, Darvis said that the top of the box, so to speak, was formed if it was untouched for three days. So here we have one day of trading, two day of trading, and three days of trading. So now the top of that box is confirmed. So Darvis would look for a breakout from that box. He would buy, and stocks traded in eighths back then, so one eighth, roughly 13 cents above the box, and one eighth below the box. Now, keep in mind that you could argue that, okay, well, it was an eighth back then, now it's decimalization, so it's one penny above, one penny below. Well, for testing purposes, I'm going to keep... Darvis at face value or keep what he said at face value and I'm going to use 13 cents above and below the box. So if it breaks out of the box, you buy the stock as soon as it breaks out and then you put in a stop one eighth below the box. So one eighth above the box for entry, one eighth below the box for your protective stop. My big problem with that and even back in the 50s or 60s when I guess we wrote the book, you could see in his Q&A, a lot of people said, wouldn't you almost always get stopped out? And he said he expected to be wrong half the time. I can't imagine that he wasn't wrong even more than half the time, but maybe conditions were so great back then that stocks didn't back and fill that much. So if you think about it, let's say you're trading a breakout and the stock breaks out, how many times does the stock break out and not look back? Not that many. Usually more often than not, it comes right back in. So again, you want to buy just above that breakout point, and then you can see it would have triggered on that day there. Now, if we take a look at the stock intraday, that's the top of the box there. That would have been your entry, 1213, and your stop would have been 1187, with the top of the box being 12. Now, initially, I sort of set out to prove that he would have gotten stopped out, but on this particular trade, it actually did not stop out. It came really, really close, as you could see. Now, if you were saying buy one penny above, sell one penny below, it crossed that top of the box several times. So there's a good chance that you could have gotten stopped out with this method. And then the other thing too is like, where do you buy back in? I think he buys when it crosses right back above. And it seems like that would happen so many times in a normal case that you would end up getting chewed up or die a death of a thousand cuts. So again, more often than not, I think you would get stopped out on the false breakouts. But if you're trading a breakout market, I think like IPOs, which tend to break out and keep following through, not all the time, but sometimes. I think you would stack your odds, the odds in your favor, a little bit more. And I'll show you a couple examples of that in just one second. Now, this is how I played this particular stock. And I was, I've was i been crazy busy lately, but I didn't actually see this until like two minutes before the close. And 
usually if you know me, I tend to, anything that I show in a presentation, I make sure that I make public before I trade it. And then that way everyone can say, well, this isn't in hindsight, it didn't cherry pick. But I did trade this stock a few days ago. And this would be your Darvis box. And we just showed the stock intraday. And in this particular case, it didn't have any bleed back into the box or none to speak of, or certainly not 13 cents. I did drop below the box. But if you're using one eighth, as Darvis said, again, it would not have stopped out. So I had a buy at B on this particular day. And it was also the Landry Light five day SMA IPO breakout strategy. And I don't have a better name for that yet. I need to work on that someday. But that's just a five day SMA. And when you get a when you get Landry Light above the five day SMA and you get a new closing high in an IPO, it's a good time to buy. Buy it B, a little less stringent rules, but there's a few caveats to that one, that pattern too. But anyway, I saw this literally a few minutes before the close, and I barely had no, enough time to get my orders in. And this is just one representative account. I wanted to show you how it worked out. But what happened was I was able to get in right around the close, about two and a half minutes before the close or so. And then right after the close, or a little while after the close, I should say, the stock jumped quite a bit. And I just felt like it was a gift horse. My brother-in-law makes fun of me because I say horse. I think I just said it, horse. <laughs> somebody texted me, somebody uh, on YouTube. What is your accent, Philly? I'm like, no, I'm a coon ass. <laughs> so, and that'll slip out every now and then too. So there was original trades on a representative account of a thousand shares. And I immediately flipped out 500 shares about an hour or two in after hours trading. I think two hours later in after hours trading, I happened to notice it was up. Actually, a client called me and said, hey, did you see this IPO? And I'm like, yeah, I'm, I'm long. And he goes, well, it's up big in after hour, which I was glad he called me. I'm sure I would have seen it before I went home, but I'm, I do want to thank him for that. So a buck 42 on a thousand shares, nothing to sneeze at. I figured it was worth taking the profits and went in lock, lock and load on half of them and boring overnight gaps, which in this market, who knows, right? But boring overnight gaps, the worst I could do in the remainder position is break even. And this, and this thing continues to run, I have a chance for a home run. Now, OCFT is a stock that I'm long and that was in the trading service. And it was a, a cup and handle, a, a deep pullback over here back in late May and triggered, I think, in early June. And when I looked at the chart recently, as I'm updating my trading service and adjusting stops and such, I'm like, holy moly, this thing was an IPO that took off. I can't believe that I missed it. And luckily, I went back in and I actually did catch a buy at B in this particular one. And hopefully, we also talked about it in the Facebook group. I don't remember. But if you do a search on OCFT in the Facebook group, we will be able to find out. And I hope I mentioned this one ahead of time. But anyway, you could see that it broke out of the box, which was also a five day SMA setup and was also a buy at B. And with the buy at B and the five day SMA, the close also has to be above the first day's trading, as you can see, which it was in this particular case. But choose your favorite breakout methodology. And I probably spend too much time telling you my stuff's not the greatest in the world. I should just say, my stuff's the greatest in the world. <laughs> but in this particular case, you can see that the Darvis box would have worked just as well because you would have bought on that day when it broke out. Now, I don't know if there would have been any backing and filling with the box. But it would have been interesting. Now, the Darvis box, keep in mind, buys intraday. And these early IPO strategies, these pioneer strategies, as I call them, buy on a close. There's two patterns that we buy on a close, the buy at B and, again, the five-day SMA pattern. And in doing such, there's no backing and filling because we're buying on a close. Now, it might, in after hours, immediately drop like a stone. It happens. but 
if you were using the box theory and you also required it to bind a close, then you wouldn't get stopped out because until at least the following day, right? You would hold at least one night. But the if you're using the box theory, and I don't have data going back this far, I don't know if it backed and filled in that day and if you'd have got chewed up or whatever. So with any breakout methodology, be super careful that you could end up getting chewed up quite a bit and and you could be a victim of a lot of false breakouts. Now, we played this pullback over here, as I just said, but if you were to put a Darvis box in there, that's what the Darvis box would look like. And remember, Darvis only bought a brand new highs. So the top of the box would extend all the way back to here. Okay, January 13th, that's what it looks like right around there. And then obviously the bottom of the box would be way down here in April. And he wouldn't buy until it made brand new highs and broke out the box. So if I'm interpreting his box theory correctly, that's what the box would look like. And you go to box on this day here. We actually got long, and I can check the spreadsheet real quick. We actually got long at 14. So 14 was right here. You can see huge thrust higher, big picture cup and handle, deep pullback, and then the trigger was right here at 14. And it kind of meandered for a little while and then finally took off nicely. And we took half our shares off on this big up day here. And now we're, rate, we're riding the remainder for, and I'm gonna say that word, hope, hopefully a long, long, long time. And that's where the real money is as I preach in these longer term positions. But in both particular cases, as you can see in this particular IPO, and the one I just showed you a few minutes ago, the box or breakouts or choose your favorite breakout methodology would have worked pretty darn good. And again, breakouts work in markets that work well with breakouts or breakouts work in markets that are breaking out and following through. Now, one thing I thought about when I dusted off my copy of Darvis and looked at his boxes, and it's something that I do intraday anyway, and not necessarily drawing boxes, but just drawing a line or eyeballing a line at new highs and new lows for the day. And if we get to when we get the live charts, we could take a look at this on the live charts. But kind of flipping the script a little bit, Darvis's methodology. It is hard to give a presentation when you can your ass hand it to you. <laughs> I might have to short some futures. Anyway, Darvis's methodology is made to put you into trending stocks or trending markets, but I think a hidden use of it would be to stay out of choppy markets. Now, here's the thing. When I started all my trend following research, geez, I'm gonna date myself. Has it been 30 years? Oh my God. Well, let's just say at least 25, 26, 27, could be 27 years ago. When I started my trend following research, I discovered a lot of amazing things in markets that were trending, but the trending, the non-trending periods, I got chewed up a lot. And I kept thinking, boy, if I could figure out a way to stay out of the choppy markets and only stay in the trending markets, I would own the world. Well, that's a bit of a grail hunt, okay? If you knew when to not put capital in harm's way and only put capital in harm's way when you knew you would make money, so you're not really putting capital in harm's way, right? You would own the world. So it is a bit of a grail hunt, but there are things you could do that might help you to stop from getting chewed up quite a bit. So if we take a look at the spiders intraday, and this is going back a couple of weeks, I tend to remember this day in particular because I think, and don't quote me on this, but I think I did not get sucked into any trades. But you can see it did make a low fairly quickly. It was a bit of an opening gap reversal type of situation. It took off and made a high. Now the top of that box is not known until three bars. One, two, three, there's the top of the box. And then it made a new low. Now, I remember kind of sitting on my hands thinking, well, let me just see if this is just going to be a fake out to the downside. And luckily it was. And then that gave me the bottom of the box at least three bars later. So this is a five minute bar in the SPY. So one, two, three bars later. Now we have the bottom of the box 
And what I found interesting is the rest of the day, the market just stayed in the box. Now, there's been days where I've gotten into a position in the futures and gotten stopped out and dropped an F-bomb, of course. I'm still human, right? Just because I decided to trade doesn't mean I don't longer have a no longer have a pause. I'm probably a little bit emo more emotional than I should be, and that's why trading does not necessarily come naturally to me. Okay, as I've said before, I cry like a girl, a schoolgirl, when I'm forced to watch a Nicholas Sparks movie. But anyway, long story endless. On this particular day, if memory serves, I sat on my hands and did not get caught up in this market. And once the box formed. Within about an hour or so of trading, maybe a little bit longer, I said, okay, well, so far we're just in a chop suey kind of market. I'm going to sit on my hands and not get too excited one way or the other. So that could be an alternate use for the Darvis methodology of the Darvis boxes. Let's take a look at today's action so far. We had a little box coming into today. We found the high, we found the low. Remember, three bars after the bottom of the box defines the bottom, and three bars after the top of the box defines the top. So you got to be careful not to look at these things in hindsight. And then the market did break out, break down out the bottom of the box. And it looks like it's trying to break out again. But you could see that Darvis, if you'd have been playing that Darvis breakdown, you would have gotten chewed up in the market. So now we have a little bit bigger box working. And so far, the market's pretty choppy, although we are trying to take out the bottom of the range as I'm speaking. And that's probably why some stops just got hit, but that's okay. He who fights and runs away lives to fight another day. So that's just an alternate use. You might want to maybe use that to try to keep you out of markets that are choppy and keep you in markets that are trending. Now, one thing kind of cool about the Darvis box is... He was he played things kind of close to the vest early on, and that's that's going to be one of the lessons I'm going to talk about if I ever get around to finishing this piece. That's sort of like the same thing we do with the swing trade when we go into the swing trade. Okay, so we go into a swing trade hoping it's going to be the mother of all winners like the OCFT, and we play it with a fairly tight stop. Okay, a swing trade stop. We want to be able to survive at least a few days worth of trading, and then hopefully that's enough for us to get that initial profit target out. And then we begin to loosen the stop up a little bit. Now, what I call a box stock, and this whole this whole Darvis rabbit hole, if you want to call it that, started when somebody about a week or two ago called me up and said, hey, what do you think about DOCU, D-O-C-U? And I said, well, it's one of those, what I would call box stocks, doesn't necessarily let you in or have any setups, but it keeps making boxes on top of boxes. And if you knew a way to recognize it ahead of time, you don't in the world. For me, the only way for me to recognize them or catch them is to have some sort of pattern or methodology to get in, and that would be pullback. So if you go back to the OCFT trade we just talked about, to get into that, what appears to be becoming a box stock, I used my methodology of trading pullbacks. Okay, that's a secondary position in an IPO, a secondary setup in an IPO which is the same thing as the core methodology. And that's why I recommend a trading service, which, uh, which I often call the core trading service. That's the, the bread and butter and the main thing I follow, although IPOs can be quite lucrative at times with these aforementioned breakout strategies. The point I was trying to get to, believe it or not, I have one, is Darvis kind of played it close to the vest early on, although I do think, again, he would get chewed up a lot trying to do the same exact thing in today's markets. Maybe if we just get into rip-roaring bull market, he would do just fine. But he did play close to the vest early on, as do we, and then he loosened his stops up as the stocks moved more and more in his favor. And he would put his stop below the boxes as they were made. So once the box, so if a stock just took off and went straight up, he wouldn't put a new stop in until the next box form. And then he would move that stop up to that box and then rinse and repeat. Well, that's something similar we're doing with by letting the stocks, letting the stops gradually open up over time. A stock can go up base for a little while and then hopefully rinse and repeat. So let me draw that in real quick. So again, we got in here at 14. And I think our stop was here around 11. Now, percentage wise, that seems huge. But if you look at the chart, I mean, we're just not that far below the low, okay? Which, if you add that or subtract this from this and then add it to this, 
So in this case, three points, you had three points of that. 14 plus three is what, 17? So the initial profit target was right here. So once you hit that initial profit target, you come to break even with the money management, as you know. And then sometimes if it moves in your favor, you might stair step a little bit in between before that actually happens. But at this particular time, point in time, okay, stop being here. The worst we could do barring overnight gaps is break even. Now, what I do once it hits initial profit target is instead of trailing on like a one for one basis, I begin to let this loosen up a little bit. And as it makes new highs, I began to let it loosen up more and more. Now, let me see if I can find out where the exact stop is now. The stop in here on OCFT is 20, okay? So a little bit higher than what I have drawn in. Stop is actually, so on this particular day here, probably I brought it up to 20. But you can see that these Darvis boxes are forming on top of boxes. So this was the top of the box, remember that? Now this becomes the top of the box, and then one, two, three, this becomes the bottom of the box, okay? So notice what's happening as I think as the boxes broke out to new to form new boxes, Darvis would bring its stop in below the bottom of the old box. Now initially, again, his stop would be right here, his entry would be here, his stop would be here, and more often than not, again, I think he would get stopped out, especially in today's markets. I know I beat the dead horse on that, but if you kind of look at what I'm doing, I'm sort of doing the same thing as once a box is formed, just kind of by slowly letting that stop loosen up we're getting that stop below the boxes okay so let's see where the box is now this is the top of the box here because we have what one two three darvis speak days where the box wasn't touched so 29 is the top of the box this is the bottom of the box because we have one two three days where the bottom of the box isn't touched so that's our new box 21 to 29 round numbers and whereas I'll stop right around 20, so we're about a point below, or exactly a point below the bottom of the box. So you could see, again, if you knew which stocks would become box stocks, like this one, box on top of box on top of box. They call that pyramiding boxes. Let me draw that in on the side. So the best stocks would pyramid the boxes higher. And they would look something like that, box on top of box on top of box. That's why I call them box stocks. This, if you figured out how to identify this right here and knew this would become this, obviously you'd own the world. And if I ever did it, that's another one of those, you'd never see my fat ass again. I'm working on a lot of things that if I ever figure out, you'd never see my fat ass again. <laughs> I'm half kidding. All right, let's hop into the, I've kind of beat the dead horse on this. Hopefully next week, there'll be enough time to get into some of the lessons that he learned. And he learned a lot about, there's a lot of trading psychology buried in that book. And I'm amazed at how much knowledge is in that book. But one thing I thought about is reading it 20 years ago and then reading it again yesterday. I think that it probably takes a little bit of experience to recognize how much knowledge is really in there. So I would encourage you to read it. If you're brand new to trading, and I would encourage you to read it if you've been trading for a long, long time. Okay, let's hop into the live charts. If you guys want to start asking questions about individual issues, feel free to do so now. All right, let's start with the S&P 500. And before we do that, as I said earlier, let's do this. Let's take a look at the spiders intraday and just see what Mr. Darvis would be telling us about the market. All right, so here are the spiders today. As you see, they're pretty choppy. So let's let's just have some fun here. I know you probably wanna party with me. <laughs> so where's the open? So the market opens, this is the open here for today. We come down here, one, two, three. Okay, so now we have the bottom of the box. And then one, two, three. So now we have the top of the box. So top of the box is up here. Bottom of the box is here. We took out the bottom of the box. One, two, three. So now we have the bottom of the box here. Okay. And you can see we are just kind of breaking down below the bottom of the box. 
But if you were trading a Darvis box, and I know there's some caveats where he probably wouldn't be trading a five minute Spire box, but you could see that if you'd have taken this breakout, let's say here, you would have lost money. And this breakout here, you would have lost money. And this breakout here, because it's retraced back up, you would have lost money, okay? So lots and lots of fake outs, but when I see a day like today, so far, I'm seeing a pretty choppy day with maybe a little bit of a bias to the downside. So if I'm gonna short this market, I might wait for some sort of pullback or setup to go short. Now we did just, we just banged the 20 day highs and that kind of comes circles back to the breakout characteristics, right? So let's take a look at that real quick. So if we're looking at 20 day highs, you can see we just hit that yesterday, okay? So we don't have the top of the box just yet for the S&P 500 other than right here when it broke out to the new high, okay? Now, while on the S&P 500 on the daily chart, you can see that so far we've broken out above this prior little high in here. So, so far so good. Today's action notwithstanding, okay? But for the most part, things are looking pretty good. Now, one thing I've been noodling with a lot lately, or a lot again, is the 30-day exponential moving average and using Landry Light with that. And if you're using stock charts, ACP, I actually have an indicator built in now there, so it's pretty cool. And then Metastock also has it too, so getting quite a few indicators built in. But Landry Light just means that the lows are greater than the moving average. And you can see here they were, here they were, here they were. And then we had a nice run here, a little bit here. And then so far, we've been doing pretty good staying above that moving average or Landry Light lows above the moving average. So far, so good vis-a-vis -vis the daylight. As usual, and as I preach, take things one day at a time. I was talking with a client yesterday and we both agreed we're probably due to get spanked <laughs> because the market's been doing so well. And if you're trading momentum, trust me, it spelled with a silent SH happens. So if we're looking at the NASDAQ, now NASDAQ's breaking down a little bit as we speak. Down about a percent and a third. It's killing me. I might have to short some futures. <laughs> But you can see, longer term, it looks pretty darn good. In fact, you can almost draw a line underneath all the bars. You can see we've had Landry Light all the way since April 9th. So you're probably thinking, geez, Dave, this Landry Light's the best thing in the world. Well, you might be right, because let's back this chart out a little bit. And look at this, this big old stupid slide we had. You had Landry Light the whole slide down. And then look at this uptrend we had. Whoa, you had Landry Light almost the whole uptrend. Well, before you get too excited, and let's not start kissing each other just yet, just realize that everything works better than trip with trends. So I've showed you something really simple here that works incredibly well when a market is trending. And when a market isn't, not so much. But you can sort of say, well, maybe let's just see. Okay, if we have a few days of downside Landry Light, maybe the market's not doing so good. Maybe you sit on my hands and wait until we have upside Landry Light. And if you have upside followed by downside followed by upside, maybe you're just at a chop, choppy market. And when all that starts to happen, you might just want to start drawing a trend line above the pivot highs and pivot lows. Or if you prefer, draw a Darvis box and say, okay, well, if we have Landry Light with a 30-day EMA, and we take out the Darvis box, maybe things are improving. You might want to write that down, just discovering that by accident, but with the IPO thing, box breakout and Landry Light above the 30, I'm sorry, the five day SMA, that might actually work, okay? Write that down. <laughs> Let's take a look at the Rusty. Rusty, not quite as impressive as the other indices, but having a pretty good day in spite of the NASDAQ being kind of weak in here, beginning to break down. But you've got a little Landry light here with a 30, okay? And you can see we're kind of stuck in a range, or if you prefer to call it a box, a bigger box. And then we broke out a little box in here, or a little range. But so far, so good as a general statement with the Rusty. Obviously, the Rusty has a ways to go to get back the brand new highs. But, you know, routine, again, take things one day at a time. Now, while we're up here, let's take a look at gold, okay? 
gold has been on fire as of late. And look at the Landry light there, okay? I feel like Tiny Elvis is gonna come out. It's huge. And then look at the Landry light, even more impressive is look at the Landry light, bam, and silver. Winning, okay? Now, one thing I've been talking about a little bit lately is, now silver's a choppy market, so it might not be the best example in the world, but you can see if you wait until you have some serious Landry light, and then wait for a pullback back to that 30-day EMA. I think I called them daylight pullbacks in my third book, which now they'd be called Landry light pullbacks. And for that, I was using the 20 EMA, but I think the 30 would be a little bit better because you get a deeper pullback. But if you're in a really trending market, obviously markets might not pull back to that 30-day EMA. And by the way, you know everything works better than trends with trends. So Landry light pullbacks, what do we have with OCFT? Look at that, beautiful setup, okay? Nice thrust higher, nice Landry light. How many days? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, okay? I think daylight pullbacks or Landry light pullbacks, you had to have 10 days of Landry light and then you look for a pullback to the EMA. So, so far, so good. Just for S and Gs, let's put in a 20 day EMA. And you know, when the market's trending like crazy, a 20 day EMA, you might have to go to like a 20. No, we didn't get to the 20. Okay. So you wouldn't have got that secondary setup. This is the 20 and the cyan. So in this case, yeah, you would have gotten the first setup back here with the 30. Okay. But notice that we never did come down to kiss that moving average. Now, the reason I'm showing you something that can be, I don't want to say quantified, but something that could be qualified like a Landry light pullback is so someone new to trading can wrap their head around a simple methodology, especially if they take the time to learn the money management. We got a new guy in the Facebook group and he's a gold member of my trading site. He's also in the trading service and he's like a sponge. He's reading 10 different books on technical analysis right now. Well, we all have to go through that trader's journey and I saw somewhere where Darvis himself, after he bought his first stock and then failed miserably, read 200 books on the market. I have so many books, I'm looking at them now on my shelves, that, and I've got some pretty serious supports in there. I could, I actually can support my own weight, and I'm a fat bastard <laughs> when we put in these floating shelves, but these floating shelves are beginning to sag. I have probably a ton of books on them, right? And most of, most of, most of which are pretty worthless, but every now and then I'll, I'll pull one off the shelf. <laughs> Like I didn't even realize that uh, Darvis wrote Wall Street the other Las Vegas and I just happened to have that on the shelf. So I'm gonna read that one and see what else I can learn about Mr. Darvis and how we can apply it to these markets. But anyway, getting back to the aforementioned gentleman and there's two or three guys right now. So you probably all think it's you, but it's, it's, it's a combination of you guys. And instead of trying to learn all those things, why don't you just trade daylight pullbacks or Landry light pullbacks? Gotta use to say, put my name in that, okay? Yeah, if you want to start asking about individual stocks, please start asking about them now. That, that'd be great. And I'll get to them in just a few minutes. But why not just trade this one pattern, okay? And wrap your head around that, get good at that, and then move on to another pattern and then learn more and more. You can't try to incorporate all of this stuff. Again, that ton of books, the ton of aforementioned books, I probably use 1% of what I learned from all those books. Maybe a little bit more when it comes to books that are re related to psychology. But for the most part, what I'm doing is fairly simple and I'm not using an oscillator, as you can see, or any other indicators. In fact, I always look at a blank chart first before adding any indicators, as you probably notice. Now, let's go to a couple of sectors in here. Let's take a look at energies. Energies are kind of stuck in a range, as you can see. Although I am seeing some low priced issues begin to fly off the lows, so we could see some. Setups there soon. Gold as you would gold as you would expect, breaking out the new highs. Silver too for the most for the most part today, notwithstanding for the most part. <laughs> Drugs up here at brand new highs. You can see nice little breakout so far remains intact there. Biotech same sort of thing there there too. Pulling back a little bit, but for the most part looking pretty good. Health services. I feel tiny elbows coming out again. Look at look at that trend. It's huge. Breaking out nicely new highs in a very persistent manner. So we could certainly see quite a few more setups here. In fact, I've got one on today's watch list that we're looking to get in. 
in the health services. A couple other areas doing really good, retail. And here's the thing that's kind of got me excited, maybe not to today notwithstanding, standing as we're pulling back a little bit in here, but recently these strong, strong, strong areas, they weakened a little bit, but then they became strong again. So the old momentum is still the new momentum. So far, so good in retail and anything technology related, or most anything technology related, as you would expect. The NASDAQ banging on new highs looks pretty good. There's hardware. If you have hardware, what do you need? You need software, right? And then uh, semiconductor is doing pretty good in here today, notwithstanding. So, the state of the market is good as a general statement. So, let's go ahead and open it up for individual stock picks TXAC. Okay, well, I wouldn't, I don't know if I'd rush out and buy this one just yet. Let's let's look at a couple things. First of all, and I might throw out a little IPO, a little treat for you here in a second. It's not gonna trigger to the close, so don't get anxious. Okay, so we've had pretty good volume, pretty good volume. Eh, it's volume, oh, look at that, 30,000, 20,000, 50,000, or 45,000. 7,000, 8,000, eh, volume's a, a little bit on the light side on this one. So I'd see this kind of dangerous. I do like what I call a first deep retracement in IPOs, but this one's a little bit on the extreme side. So what I would do here is, first of all, I'm probably not going to take this setup because it's too thin. As one of the guys in the group pointed out, John R, I think, might have been John Z, I forget. I get my Johns confused. If you get into an IPO that's thin like this, you could end up in a hotel California. It's hard to get out. They'll let you in, but it's hard to get out. If somebody's watching a live screen right now, what's the spread? Let me know what the spread is on this one too. So if it's got like a one point spread, it might just be too darn thin to trade. But if I were to trade this, and this, this is kind of an extreme move higher, so I probably would be cautious because of this move here. But if I were to trade it, it would have to close above $16 a share. Now, let me give you a little treat here. I hope it's gonna become a treat for me. This is one that I'm watching. I'm not sure what this is back here, but it looks like this is now a legitimate stock. Trades quite a few shares, okay? I want this a way to zoom it in and just get this. I think if you look at this on stock charts, it doesn't show all this mess back here. So ignore that. The buy at B, you buy it, the new closing high with some caveats, okay? And let's put in a five-day moving average. Okay, so we don't have Landry Light with that. So it wouldn't be that set up, but it will be a buy at B. So on this particular stock, I've got a little note to remind me that if we close at a new closing high, which would be around here somewhere, if I could draw a straight line, let me just tell you about what, the, well, it's gonna have to close at 16 and change, okay, for me to get excited about it. So let's just say 16.50 or higher, I'll probably go. So 80 cents spread, yeah, that's a pretty big spread on that stock. So as soon as you buy it, you're off 80 cents on TXAC, so we'll have to keep an eye on that, okay? Okay, Griff wants to talk about GBTC. That, I, I don't think, if you give me a second, I'll have to uh, pull that up in stock charts. For some reason, TC sees that as a penny stock, okay? So what I'll have to do is pull it up in stock charts. So give me a, a second to get that up and running. And while I'm doing that, why don't, let's go ahead and take a, take a look at this PSTX. See, it's stocked. This is one thing I would recommend if possible, if your budget allows it, to have more than one data feed to use, okay? And then I suppose if you have a, a, a quote screen that comes with your brokerage, then you also have automatically have another data feed. So let's take a look at a couple things. So here's this PSTX. It looks more like an IPO here because it's not showing you all the other trading. It's funny, you know, I'll get emails from people sometimes and you'll have a stock that's 
about to become delisted and a new stock's getting ready to take over and the stock's that's about to become delisted is trading at like a dollar a share and the new stock that's going to take over the symbol is going to come public at 10. People are like, if I buy that stock at $1, is it going to be worth $10 when it goes public? Not, no, no, that, it doesn't. Unfortunately, there's no free lunches. It doesn't work that way. But in this particular case, getting back to this PSTX, you can see closing high would be this day here. So if it makes a new closing high, and technically it did sort of trigger, but it really didn't make that much of a new closing high on that particular day. So I like to see a little bit more. So end of the day today, up around 1650, I will be buying the stock on the close. Now, if you're watching the recording of this, you can come to these shows live and I'd love to have you live. Love to get the numbers back up again, so please do. Now, this whole thing started with Griff asking about GBTC. Now, if I'm going to trade Bitcoin, and I do trade Bitcoin, I prefer just to trade the Bitcoin in and of itself. And we'll take a look at that. Right now, I'm not that excited about this GBTC. Let's see if we can zoom it in a little bit because it came up here, it made new highs, it kind of sold off, and now it's trying to rally again. So it's certainly improving. Now, let's Take a look at Bitcoin itself. So if you're gonna trade Bitcoin, here's the thing. The doctors love this for some reason. I hate to pick on doctors, but and when they in touch with me, it's like what's well, all usually a friend of a doctor. Hey, my friend, the doctor is asking me about GBTC. It's like just trade the actual Bitcoin itself. Okay. Now I get it. If you've got an IRA or a cash account somewhere or something and you want to buy Bitcoin, you could certainly buy the GBTC. The reason I'm not a huge fan of it, the GBTC that is, is because it trades at a really, really huge premium. So for whatever reason, and I don't know what the premium is, is now, and there are people on the internet that track the premium on this, and they claim that when the premium shrinks, it's a good buying opportunity, or premium expands, good selling opportunity. That in and of itself might be a trading system. I don't know. But anything with a 20% premium scares the bejesus out of me because what if overnight that premium comes out? So by premium, I mean, okay, it's 1056, but it's probably only worth about $9, let's just say. I'm just pulling these numbers out the air, but it's probably only worth $9 worth of Bitcoin. So why are you paying that premium? Okay. And what 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 do you get with that premium? Now let's shift over to, let me just show you a couple things with Bitcoin and believe me, this will work with any market, but the caveat is everything works better with trim. So let's get over to ACP. So if we add in the Landry light down here, now I'm giving away this, these, this plugin, so I don't make anything from it, but if you enjoy it, Tell the good folks over at stockcharts.com that you enjoy it and that davelandry.com or Dave Landry is awesome and davelandry.com is awesome too. So let's go to a daily chart and I hope I could do this without screwing things up. So let's go to BTC USD. Now, by the way, I trust all these exchanges. I got way more money and it's not much money, but it's way more money than I want to have in, this, in these exchanges. I trust these Bitcoin exchanges about as far as I can throw them, okay? <laughs> just an FYI. So I'm just going to do 30 periods because that's what I've been really having fun with, playing with. I know you want to party with me, right? Again, let's do a 30-day Landry light, okay? And let's make the reference smaller. Now, on top of this, let's go in and let's go in and add a 30-day exponential moving average. And, well, I'll leave this set up so later in the chart show, if we want to play around with some other markets, that'd be kind of fun to do. I know, you're thinking once again, I want to party with this guy. Hey, let's play around with exponential moving averages. Yay. I'm going to tell my friends. Okay, so here's the thing. With the 
Landry light, meaning the lows are greater than the moving average, okay? We measure that down here, and this counts the magnitude. This is just number of days of daylight. If you go back and watch some presentations I did maybe a year or so ago, I spent a lot of time playing with this in Metastock, and now the good folks over at stockcharts.com were able to program this in for me, and so I'm messing around with a little bit here. But the Landry light pullback, okay, you would have gotten in Bitcoin around somewhere around, let's say, 9,300. Okay, and assuming you had a stop down like at 800 or something, 8,000, I'm sorry, you'd probably still be long. But what I'm seeing now, as you could see too, is we've had Landry light on both sides and you had none here because we just keep chopping around the moving average. But yeah, it's starting to break out now. Okay, but what did I just spend an hour saying? Breakouts work well when markets are breaking out and following through. So I would not rush out and trade. I do own some Bitcoin, FYI, but I would not rush out and buy new positions just because it's breaking away from the moving average. I would wait to see if it can continue to break out and keep on breaking out. Now, getting back to everything works better with trend, what happened earlier this year? And I actually missed it, and I'm a little bit mad at myself, okay? because I was so busy caught up in stocks and worried about dying from COVID-19. <laughs> Laugh to keep from crying. I totally missed this big slide in Bitcoin. And notice that you had the Landry light to the downside, a little bit of a pullback, a little bit of a kiss, and then it imploded again. That's absolutely beautiful. But if you get bored, go in here and play around with this. And look, everything works better with trend. Look how beautiful that trend is there. That should get you excited. But then you'll be excited, then you need to find something else to do other than trading. But just scroll back in time and look. Here you go. Look at this beautiful trend here, okay? It went up forever, a little bit of a, a kiss, okay? And then it went up again. Nice, nice, nice trend higher. If memory serves... I was long this trend. I do seem to remember buying around $11,000 of Bitcoin. And I remember thinking I'm the stupidest guy in stupid town, buying a piece of something that's electronic, a piece of nothing, right? <laughs> but I think what I'm going to do with Bitcoin is if I can make some more money there, I think I'm going to turn it, turn it into hard assets and hopefully rinse and repeat. But anyway, so that's a long-winded uh, talk about Bitcoin, but Bitcoin could be any other market. We could insert any other market here and talk about it, okay? Stuart wants to talk about FSLY. FSLY I like because it's trending. The only thing lately I've been kind of focusing on is how do we get into an FSLY before it becomes an FSLY, okay? Which brings me back to OCFT. So I tried getting in back here. I actually did okay, stopped out. You know, I dropped some F bombs when I stopped out, but then I looked at my account and it was bigger than it was before I traded OCFT. So I had to quit complaining because I always tell my clients when we stop out, giving up some of those open profits and you, and you piss and moan, <laughs> send me the money, stop bitching, you know? But I find myself doing the same thing. So I'm human too. So how do we get into an FSLY or an OCFT early, right? So now OCFT might set up again, could be the greatest next setup and next setup trading town, right? It made no sense, but could be the greatest setup and setup town. But it's all, it's all, it's it's already had a pretty good run. Now it doesn't mean that it can't keep going further. So I do like FSLY. This one has been in the Landry list on and off for quite a while. I would actually like a little bit deeper pullback to it, but now that it's pulling back a little bit today or selling off a little bit today, maybe an entry right here, and then believe it or not, you would have to have a really, really, really wide stop. Your stop would be way down here at 70. So my problem with something like this is your stop is so wide, you'd probably end up with like exactly 200 shares in a $100,000 account. So you're not gonna end up with a lot of shares and it still could be worthwhile. It's kind of like Chewy. We didn't end up with a, with a lot of shares in Chewy, but it, you know, you come in some days and it's up two or three points, and it's like, well, it's better than a poke in the eye, okay? And I hate to use the word hope, but hopefully Chewy will become the next box stock, okay? We got in on this little pullback back here. 
it scared the bejesus out of us for a while, but finally began to take off. Okay, TBIO. TBIO I like. Pretty much like anything, well, not as much as I thought I did. I pretty much like anything with buy on the name. The problem with this one is, and I don't know if this is a prior Landry list candidate or not, or member, but it shot higher and it's just really this one big update and it came all the way back in. Now, I know last week we talked about Return to Paradise, which John R. and the group came up with, where these stocks shoot higher, come way back in, and then take off again. But that's a little bit more extreme example, such as this company here, which makes unmanned agricultural aerials, whatever the flip that is. <laughs> so, and the system we talked about there last week, something I'm just kind of taking his research and running with it, would be to... And this is something I'm not actually trading yet, although I wish I would have started trading, at least on this particular chart. But find one of these wild and crazy stocks. And again, this might just be church of what's happening now. Something to just blast higher, let it come back down below its 30-day EMA, or at least intersect it, and then look to buy it when it makes a wide range bar seven and closes above the open. This right here would be the same pattern, although it never did kiss the moving average so this is just the first example i found with this or since i thought about it this is actually i thought of, i found this on a friday and said that's a pretty cool thing and on monday it was already gapping higher but anyway so that might be a church of what's happening now i have not incorporated this yet and yet being a key word into my core methodology but it is something that i think is worth researching and this is the beauty of having that Facebook group is we're able to noodle with a lot of these things. So yeah, that stock kind of took off, getting back to where we were. It kind of took off, but I wouldn't call it a return to paradise pattern. And also, as a general statement, I'd be very leery of any stock that just pops up one day, spends maybe a day and a half there, and then comes all the way back in. So I think in biotechnology, there's probably something better you could be trading. So just for S and Gs. All right, keep the stock picks coming. We got time for we got time for a few more. Let's take a look at like 90-day volume. See, biotech overall looks like this. Okay, draw your big blue arrows, draw your persistent. Persistency lines, draw your linear regression persistency lines, which is, how do you do that in telechart? Oh, right here, which should pretty much equal this line or thereabouts close enough, okay? And find something that's looking pretty good, like MRNA, I wouldn't rush out and trade this one. I'm not a big fan of cup and handles at high levels. I know Charlie Kirk likes them, but you can see kind of a high level cup and handle. That looks better than the other one that just kind of went and came in. Gilead's all over the place. This one's trending but not set up. Amgen, let's see. If we could find some. That one's trending. Make sure that's in your momentum list. I know it's in mine, Index. Let's just see what we could find in here. Something that looks really good. Nice trends, okay? There's LabU. Here's another return to paradise. Isn't that crazy? Look at that. Shot up to 100, came down to 50 on its way back to 100. Well, on its way back down to 50, I guess now. Let's see if we could find. Well, at the least, it's quite a few BGNE, okay? Put that on your watch list. That might be worth watching a little bit deeper pullback, although it, it has ran to pretty high levels. So in general, these biotechs do need a little more pullback. I really not, I thought we'd, we'd, we'd find a few in here, but so far not yet. But you can see quite a few are trending nicely and cleanly. And then, you know, the HV is just totally whack. Like, look at this one, ALT, HV is 160. You go back and watch some presentations I did. I swore I would never trade a stock with HV that high. But now I think we're we're left with this. And I could see a couple of my patterns going back in time. I wonder why we missed that. That's the other thing, too. If you want to get better at trading, when you look at that charts, See, I see a little TKO here. Well, actually, I guess the TKO wasn't deep enough, but what you can do 
what I do is because I make a reporting every day as I go in, when I see a stock like this, and that's exactly what I did with the OCFT and the DOCU, is I go in and look at what I said for that day, and that makes, that helps me to see whether or not I found the setup in real time. So let's see. I mean, this one's kind of interesting. Nice longer term uptrend, pulling back a little bit. See, that would catch my eye. I mean, you know, volatility is whack. I think I've traded this one before. That was VBIV. Anyway, and that's one thing. Look, there's your stock. Okay, so look at that one. And I'm not trying to beat you up, Stuart, uh, but I'm just saying go in and look at all the other ones there. And it's kind of funny. There's nothing new under the sun. And as I'm reading this, Darvis book, or rereading it, I should say, he said, if you find a stock, go out and see, look at its brethren. I'm not sure exactly how he worded it, but I always say, hey, go out and look at some, look for some sexy sisters or sexy brothers, depending on what you're into, or sexy sisters and brothers, if you're into that. <laughs> What's his name? Dennis Miller calls those people greedy bastards. <laughs> But anyway, if you find a stock you like in one sector, go in and do your homework. Look, this looks like a return to paradise type of situation. Go in and do your homework. Hey, how come I didn't see it back here? Look at that. See, I'm learning as I go here. And see if you can find any other stocks in a sector that look interesting. Like that would make my call list. It did. It's it's wild and crazy. I realize that. But again, this is the, the market we're in. We're in this wild and crazy market. HV174. Okay, any more? Going once, going twice. Well, as usual, I want to thank everybody for coming. I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule. If we don't talk to you now and then, everybody have a fantastic weekend. Thank you so much. You're welcome, Scott.